So one more architectural subject I want to touch on before we move into the organizational pieces is what I mean by a fixed and variable length instruction. So a fixed length instruction is exactly what it sounds like. If you take um, your operand and your op codes, uh, however many they are, your instruction will always take up the same amount of bits. So if you picture your binary of your application, uh, it would have, say, let's just make up numbers here. Let's say you have a 16-bit instruction. That means that every 16 bits, you will find one complete instruction, even if it's only using a portion of that uh, to actually relay anything. Maybe you don't have any operands to bring across. You will use the same 16 bits every time. A variable length instruction is exactly what it sounds like. A uh, variable length instruction can have, you know, four bits or, or even maybe a smaller amount possibly, or, you know, more likely an eight or 16 bit minimum size, or it could be 32 or 64 bits long, depending on the actual action being taken, how many operands there are, what you're referencing, like maybe a memory address, something like that, and the, the mode that you're in. Now, why uh, this difference and what are the pros and cons? So first off, I want to say that it is much more likely, in fact, almost guaranteed, that a risk-based system is going to use a fixed instruction size. Uh, also, a CISC-based uh, system would use a variable length instruction size. Now, this isn't an absolute rule, but it is almost all the time true. Now, why is that and what are the ramifications? So a fixed length instruction is much easier to decode. And if you think about it, this makes sense from the perspective of a risk machine, right? Because we said risk machines are much less complex. So because we know that the instruction is always going to be the same number of bits, we know that, you know, say we have eight bits that are the opcode, and then we have 10 bits that are possibly for operands, right? So those first eight bits are always opcode. We can write a pretty, or well, design a pretty simple multiplexer to uh, turn on different circuits based upon the output of those eight bits. We always know that those are the only things in play. If it's a variable length instruction, we need extra steps in front to actually figure out what length the instruction is. We don't know right off the bat. We need to first figure that out. Once we've determined the length of the instruction, then using more complex hardware, we can decode it because the decode step is going to be different based upon the length of the instruction. Now, this obviously gives us a more uh, versatile setup in a variable length system because we can use the same bits more wisely. Consider a halt or a no-op, for example. These instructions uh, don't really need operands. Um, and if you have a fixed length instruction and say it's 32 bits in length, you probably only needed a few of them and the rest are just, you know, null, essentially. They're just wasted space. Um, but on the flip side, even though in a variable length instruction you can make that much smaller, you're adding to the complexity of the system. All right, so in the real world, how does this affect us? Well, this, by the way, this, this kind of uh, end result is also uh, not just because of this, but also just because of the differences in CISC and RISC machines in general. The end result is power, believe it or not. So the one thing I mentioned in the last video that CISC and RISC, because of microcode helping CISC out, can pretty much benchmark the same speeds, right? Even though RISC would inherently be faster in a world without microcode. Um, but the one thing that CISC can't fix is the power consumption. Because its tendency for variable length instructions and all this extra circuitry, it chews up more power. And in fact, this extra step to translate instructions, uh, to decode them and figure out their length, is unavoidable and has a fairly uh, big impact. This is the main reason why we don't generally see CISC-based machines running our phones and our tablets and any of our IoT devices. 
um, Risk has proven to be a much more power efficient platform, which is uh, why we see ARM being so prevalent in that area. It's also interesting to note that while currently CISC is still dominant in the desktop space, not only is the desktop space not the largest space anymore, but RISC has been actually making some inroads in this area. There are some RISC-based machines. There's been a lot of flavors of Linux, for example, that have been uh, built to run on RISC as well as CISC recently. Um, but interestingly, there's rumors that Apple has been playing with the idea of moving to RISC-based architecture for their desktop machines. Now, I don't know if any of this is confirmed or if there's a timeline, even if it were, um, but it wouldn't not be unlike them. They have in the past moved from Cell to Intel, and it wouldn't surprise me if they made such a move again. They have been putting RISC coprocessors in some of their machines, um, like iMacs, for quite a while now. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me if they make that move. Uh, they've been trying to, in some ways, uh, marry what they do on iOS anyway with what they do on OS X. And moving both to the same underlying architecture would actually help in that endeavor.